Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the last day of Virtual Fox Fest, October 2022. Thanks for sticking around for the uh, for the last session. And this seems like a good opportunity to thank Rick and Doug and Tamar for everything they do to make it possible for us to gather virtually. A ton of work goes into this more than I'm sure any of us can realize. So uh, good time to say thank you for that. I'm supposed to tell you about myself. Uh, my name is Rick Borup. I've been an independent developer since 93. Uh, I had a background in uh, mainframe software development and running an IT center for the commercial banking industry until I kind of got enamored with database development and FoxPro. And like many of you, started working with it about the time Visual Fox came out. Started working with SQL Server back in 1998, kind of had a hiatus there for a while and then picked it up pretty strong over the last few years. Uh, picked up a Microsoft certification back when that was possible and had the opportunity to work with some really smart people to co-author a couple of books uh, a few years back. I also want to talk about uh, and acknowledge the contributions from some other folks. Uh, of course, the Visual Foxborough community, which has always been a terrific resource uh, and generous in sharing time and knowledge through articles and user group presentations and conferences like this one. Working with the SQL Server uh, community over the last couple of years, I found uh, them to be equally generous. One of the nice things, if anything, was, was beneficial about the pandemic was many of the user group presentations went virtual, which enabled a person like me to attend some of the groups that I would not have been able to attend in person. So I just uh, put a couple of the names there. If you're working with SQL Server, I'd really encourage you to get involved with the user groups uh, in your area or virtually across the country. And finally, a special thanks to uh, a couple of folks, Jody Meyer for uh, sharing her resources, her talent, her knowledge about working with SQL Server in Visual Fox Pro. And a shout out to Rick Schumer for his contributions to my understanding of the upsizing wizard and the data explorer, which I'll be talking about uh, in this session. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera and you should be able to see the slides a little bigger now. And we'll get right into this. Uh, here's our agenda for today. We have side, seven items. Uh, I'm gonna talk about preparing both your development environment and the database for upsizing to SQL Server. We'll talk about uh, mapping visual FoxPro data types to SQL Server data types. A Couple of decisions you'll have to make in the upsizing process. I'm gonna run through how to use the upsizing wizard in some detail. Uh, it's not the only way to upsize, but it's a good way to do it. Uh, we'll then talk about transforming what I'm calling VFP or Visual Fox Pro's implementation of the SQL language into Transact SQL, which is SQL Server's implementation. Many, many similarities, but enough differences that you have to know what you're getting into. After upsizing and deploying an app, uh, we'll take a quick look at what can go wrong. Surprisingly, yes, things can go wrong and what you can do about it. And in the same breath, we'll look at how to trap errors and how to debug transact SQL statements when you're building them in Visual Fox Pro, but executing them through SQL pass-through in SQL Server. And finally, as time allows, we'll end up by talking about a new tool that I developed to document SQL Server uh, tables. So that's where we're going. Couple of things about this session. Uh, again, this is one way to upsize a Visual Fox Pro database in an app to SQL Server. It's not the only way. There is no only way to do this. Uh, we're gonna assume you're familiar with Visual Fox Pro's implementation of the SQL language. And I'll compare VFP SQL to Transact SQL, but this is not gonna be an in-depth tutorial on Transact SQL. There are many great resources for that. And I've mentioned a couple of them uh, in the white paper and provided information for you to find those. Finally, this session is oriented toward how to interact with SQL Server as a Visual Fox Pro developer, but it's not going to teach you how to become a VFP, or excuse me, a SQL Server DBA. Uh, there's a lot of good resources on that as well, including uh, papers written by Jody Meyer and others. Uh, she has one actually entitled uh, accidental DBA, which is sort of the term for what happens when a so, uh, application developer gets into 
working with a client in SQL Server who they don't have a DBA of their own. So that's what uh, hopefully sets our expectations. And I wanted to put up the programmer's credo for just a minute here because that's kind of how we think about things going into it, uh, paraphrasing JFK, of course, but uh, we thought it was going to be easy. Maybe it wasn't as easy as we thought, but you know what? It really is pretty easy once you get to know where you're going and what you're doing. So that's where we're going today. So let's talk about, first of all, how to prepare your VFP uh, database and, for that matter, your environment for upsizing. As the developer, there are several things you're going to need. Obviously, SQL Server. Uh, you're going to want a, probably a free edition, uh, the developer edition and the express edition, both free and will serve your purposes really well. You're going to want to download and install SQL Server Management Studio, which is now a separate download. It used to be bundled with earlier versions of SQL Server, but has been separate for a while. I uh, recommend you download and install the SQL Server Configuration Manager. Gives you easy access to starting and stopping services and properties uh, for the running services. And finally, SQXML 4.0 SP1 uh, needs to be downloaded and installed for uh, bulk upload, which uh, really increases significantly the performance when you're actually upsizing the database. Uh, Microsoft is generous. All of these tools are free to download. If you're gonna follow along the examples in this session, not while we're doing it, but uh, afterwards, you'll want the VFP upsizing wizard. And we'll talk about that in some detail. Finally, you're gonna to wanna to make a decision about an ODBC driver. And your two basic choices are to use the legacy driver, which is simply referenced as driver equals SQL server uh, in your connection strings, or you may wanna choose a more recent uh, ODBC driver for SQL Server like driver 17. I think 18 is actually out now and is the current one. So just a couple of words about the ODBC drivers and the differences you may encounter. The advantage to the legacy driver is that it's bundled with Windows, which means you don't have to deploy anything, either for yourself or for your client. So that's really a terrific advantage in many ways, but the drawback is that the legacy driver does not support many of the new features and functionality in some of the newer versions of SQL Server. And as a Visual Fox Pro developer, there's another fairly serious limitation that has to do with how dates and date time fields are mapped. And we'll talk about that in some detail when we get there too. The legacy driver shows up in your data source administrator window as SQL Server. The version number 10.00.19041 uh, actually relates to the version of Windows that it was released with. This is version uh, 21H2, I believe. Uh, it's not the version that I'm running or the version that you're necessarily running, but that's why it's given a version 10. The newer driver, and I'm looking at driver 17 here, uh, does support new features and functionality, and specifically uh, for us as VFP developers, gives us better access to more date and date time data types that we can take advantage of. Disadvantages is not bundled with Windows, so you have to install it for yourself and also for your clients. And that shows up as ODBC driver 17 for SQL Server uh, in your data source administrator. Your client naturally uh, is gonna need SQL Server. Uh, if you're I'm kind of predicating this conversation in the sense that you're starting with someone who may not have SQL Server, perhaps it's a small shop, They've been running Visual Fox Pro databases all along with your app. So you may be asked to recommend SQL Server for them. It's best if you use the same version as, uh, if they use the same version you're using, if you have any control over that. If they already have something, you may have to adapt to what they have. The reason is that there are some changes in the newer versions. And if you're newer than your client, you may make assumptions about things that work a certain way that may not work the same way or at all on your client's site. And finally, if you're asked for any recommendations on hardware, the rule of thumb is just don't skip on the hardware. Get the most memory, the most disk, the fastest processor that, that they can afford if it comes down to a monetary decision. So here are some things to think about and things you might need to do as you prepare your database for upsizing. First of all, make a backup. You may find that you're gonna alter the data in preparation for upsizing. You'll see a couple of examples of why that might be necessary. Also, depending on how you use the wizard, the wizard itself may make changes to the database container uh, 
And so if you want a way to go back to uh, square one and start over again, and in my experience, you may want to run the wizard more than once for your own purposes before you go live, uh, you'll want that backup. Run validate and validate recover if necessary. Make sure there are no errors uh, in the Visual FoxPro database that could come up and bite you as you run the upsizing process. Good idea to pack and re-index the tables. Uh, there's no such thing as a deleted row in SQL Server. So you might as well get rid of all the deadwood in your tables and not have to force the upsizing process to wade through and simply ignore them. And it's also a way of cleaning up the database uh, prior to doing the upsizing. If relational integrity is uh, involved in your SQL Server data or in your Visual FoxPro database, uh, make sure that there are no exceptions. I have actually seen orphans, duplicates, and that kind of thing in Visual Fox Pro databases where relational integrity supposedly was in place to prevent that. So it's a good idea to take a look and make sure that everything is clean, especially if you're going to uh, enforce relational integrity in the SQL Server database. A fundamental tenet of database design, obviously, is that all Tables should have primary keys, but especially in older applications, you may find that they don't. If they don't, you could consider adding a surrogate key if no natural key is a candidate for that. Uh, and if you do add a surrogate key, the Visual Fox Pro Auto Inc. data type is, is a good one to choose because it maps directly to what SQL Server calls an identity column, which is simply an incremental uh, integer that starts at one and goes up from there. So it's a good a uh, way to insert a primary key if you have to come up with one that's not already there. Indexes can be an issue. In Visual Fox Pro, indexes are based on expressions. In SQL Server, they're based on column names. What this means is that you may very well have indexes in your Visual Fox Pro database that will not convert directly to SQL Server indexes. Uh, I suggest that you delete those before you run the upsizing process. They're not going to convert. You might as well avoid seeing the errors. Uh, in the process and just get rid of them before you start. Uh, one obvious example is an index on deleted, which many tables and many Visual Fox Pro databases have. Uh, again, there's no such thing as deleted rows in SQL Server, so there's no possibility of an index. You know, get rid of that index before you start the upsizing process. You're going to find yourself being uh, concerned with nulls a lot more in SQL Server than you probably were in Visual Fox Pro. The big difference is that in Visual Fox Pro, columns are not nullable unless you say that they are, whereas the reverse is true in SQL Server. Columns are nullable unless you say that they're not null. So you have to give a little consideration to what's going to happen with uh, columns that either should be or should not be nullable. And when we get to the wizard, you'll see that there's an option for determining how it should handle them. Of course, you may have to make accommodations in your application as well. Consider adding default values for all columns. The reason for that is that SQL Server will assign a null if there is no default. I should say SQL Server will attempt to define an, uh, uh, insert a null if there's no default value. If a column is defined as not null and SQL Server attempts to insert a null, of course, that's going to be a failure. Dates are an issue, something that requires kind of special attention. Uh, in Visual Fox Pro, the earliest date in a date or date time column is January 1st of the year one. In SQL Server, if you're using the date time data type, which is kind of a fallback, and I'll get into this in a little more detail later, uh, the earliest date for a date time data type is January 1st of 1753 which means that if there are any dates earlier than that in your VFP database, they will not convert. You're going to get a failure to insert that row. In any app that's dealing with the modern era, probably 1753 or earlier is an error. Maybe it was a typographical error. Uh, I saw some dates entered as 0222 instead of 2022, for example, in one database I was working with. And so might as well find those things ahead of time. You do have some options depending on the driver you're using that might circumvent this, but it's the kind of thing to look for ahead of time. Empty dates can also be an issue. Uh, there's no such thing as an empty date in, in SQL Server. It defaults to January 1st of 1900. And 
when you run the wizard, you have an option to convert empty dates in Visual Fox Pro to nulls in the SQL Server. Probably that's what you're going to want to choose unless you're willing to uh, live with January 1st, 1900 popping up wherever an empty date used to be. So that, those are some things we can do uh, in advance to prepare uh, for the upsizing process. And one of the other considerations you're going to want to uh, get into is how visual Fox Pro data types map to SQL servers. So here's a little uh, chart that kind of shows the, the basic relationships, uh, character, currency, uh, pretty much straightforward. Logicals become uh, bit values, either zero or one. So visual Fox Pro, true, false, become one or zero in SQL Server. Numerics have uh, good mapping to numeric integer and so forth in SQL Server. Uh, the ones with asterisks on them are ones that you might pay a little more attention to. Dates and date times. Uh, date time is really your only real choice if you're using the legacy ODBC driver. Uh, with the newer driver, you have other choices, and we'll see those on the next couple of slides. As far as memos and general fields are concerned, uh, the upsizing wizard out of the box is going to default to text, but you can change it, and I will show you how to do that. So let's look at dates for just a moment. On the left is the SQL Server data types. Uh, there are five of them for date times, or five that I'm aware of. And next to that, the range of values. Notice on the second and fourth lines, the date time and the small date time have a limited range. There's that 1753 I talked about earlier, and small date time even more limited. Then on the right are the choices you have available to you with a legacy driver, and on the far right with one of the newer drivers. So we'll look at that in a little more detail here. We can ignore daytime offset. That's really not one that we're going to be concerned with here. So what happens if we're using the legacy driver? Well, two of them will come back as character values rather than date values in an ODBC query. That's suboptimal, to say the least. You want dates to come back as dates so that all of the manipulation that your application is doing can work with them as dates. So we can eliminate date and date time too, leaving date time, and we can eliminate small date time because of the range is so restricted, 1900 to 2079. Uh, it may work for an app, but it's probably not ideal. So that leaves date time as the kind of de facto default if you're working with a legacy ODBC driver. And these are choices you can make in the wizard when you get to the data mapping step. If you're using the newer ODBC driver, things are much easier. You can convert dates in VFP to date data types in SQL Server. And that works just fine. And it's got the full range from January 1st of the year one all the way up to the year 9999. Similarly, uh, date time works, but you still have that 1753 restriction. So you can use date time two, which goes all the way in the same range from year one to year 9999. So to me, those are the better choices if you're using a newer driver, if that's an option for you. So I'm going to pause here. We have a minute uh, or so for questions. Um, Rick, is there anything, any questions? I, yeah, those that haven't been answered already by others. Um, can the SQL Server be in Azure? I don't know. I've not, uh, I've not done that. I don't work with Azure. I can find out for you, but I don't have an answer right here. Um, and I think, well, I think the rest have been answered. OK, thanks. Uh, we'll go on from there. And we'll have a couple of more opportunities for questions and then, of course, the Q&A session at the very end. So let's move on ahead. And we're going to talk about how to use the upsizing wizard. Uh, I decided to do this with slides because I didn't want to risk anything going wrong while we were running, while we're in the session here, if I was actually running it interactively. So the uh, screenshots that you're gonna see will be exactly what you would see if you were running this in the Visual Fox Pro IDE. So first of all, where do you get the VFP upsizing wizard? Well, it comes from GitHub. There's the URL up there and a little bit of the readme file. Doug Henning is the project manager for this. The, the brief history of this is that the the foundation for this version of the upsizing wizard was the release uh, that came with Sedna. 
And since then, it has been uh, taken over by the community and enhanced even further. So if you're going to get it, uh, if you're going to use the upsizing wizard, you're going to want to get the current one off VFPX. There are two ways to use this. The way I'm going to talk about in this session is using the wizard, uh, which is a user interface. It works great. It's very straightforward. You make several choices along the way, and then you tell it to do it, and it does it. It's really a wonderful tool. But the wizard is actually a user interface to the upsizing engine object. And there, is a, there are ways to run that programmatically. Rick Schumer wrote an article published in the uh, 2007 Code Focus magazine on Sedna. Hard to believe that's 15 years ago. Uh, and I would refer you to that article, which has a lot of great information about how to use the upsizing engine object programmatically. Uh, in this session, I'm probably going to use the term upsizing wizard kind of generically, referring both to the user interface that we're going to step through here in a minute, and also to the uh, engine object, which is actually what's doing all the work for you. So to launch the wizard, uh, it's an app. And if you download or clone from GitHub, you put it in some folder. This just happens to be the folder that I put it in. You're going to run the upsizing wizard.app. A couple of things to note. Uh, if you run the uh, wizard from the VFP main menu wizards submenu, you're going to get the old wizard. You can change that but you have to edit the wizard.dbf file. And here's a little look at how to do that. Simply use that table, uh, locate the role for Microsoft SQL Server Upsizing Wizard. In the program column, open the memo field and insert in place of what is uh, going to be there by default, insert the drive or the path to the place where you've installed the VFPX, VFPX Upsizing Wizard. And that'll take care of it if you want to run it from the wizard menu instead of from the command line. It's also possible to launch the upsizing wizard from Data Explorer if you're using the newest versions of Data Explorer. However, the Data Explorer has to be configured to do this out of the box. It doesn't know how, but uh, Rick Schumer, who's uh, responsible for this project, has made it possible to import the information that uh, enables you to run the upsizing wizard directly from the Explorer interface by right-clicking on a Visual Fox Pro database and simply clicking Upsize Database to SQL Server. I included a white uh, appendix in the white paper that has the steps to do that. We don't have time to go through them here, but there is full information about how to do that. Uh, there may, in fact, be a newer version of the Data Explorer coming at some point which uh, possibly could uh, enhance the ability to do this out of the box. So for our sample purposes, I'm using a database uh, called produce. This is a noun, not a verb, not produce, but produce like in fresh fruits and vegetables. I just chose this one as kind of a subset of some apps that I've worked with in the past. So we have seven tables, uh, customers, invoices, items, vendors, and so forth. And we have one local view in this database. This is a good point place to point out that the upsizing wizard requires a database container. It does not operate on free tables. So if you are trying to upsize an app that is using free tables, the first thing you're going to want to do is to create a database container and incorporate all of the uh, data tables into that so that you can use the upsizing wizard. The sample database also uh, enforces relational integrity. This is just a little snapshot of what the one-to-many relationships look. So it's the standard thing. Customers have one or more invoices. Invoices have one or more items. And similarly, vendors have purchase orders. And purchase orders have one or more items. Uh, we're going to want to preserve this relational integrity in the SQL Server database, so is why I'm pointing it out here. So that's kind of the background. Now let's get into the wizard itself. The wizard has six steps. Regardless of how you launch it, you're going to start with these first step and go through the same six steps. The first step is simply what database do you want to upsize? This is the Visual Foxbro database. In this case, we chose the Produce database, the one we just looked at a minute ago. So we click Open and we proceed from there. The second step is to select the destination SQL Server and SQL Server database. 
as you can see on this step, there are uh, two or three ways to connect to the database. Uh, in this example, I'm going to select ODBC. And under that selection, you have three choices. If there's a data source name involved, you can use it. Uh, you can tell the wizard to generate a SQL connection string. Uh, that can be a little time consuming because the wizard has to go out and scan your machine or your network and uh, discover how many uh, SQL servers there are and then come up with a list that you can choose from. So the fastest way is to create a connection string ahead of time, like I've done on this slide. You'll notice, by the way, this is using the legacy driver just by way of example, driver equals SQL server. And uh, having specified a connection, we click next. And assuming that the connection is made successfully, it'll go on to step three. Step three says, what's the name of the database you wanna create in SQL Server. By default, it'll be the same as the one you're coming from, but you can change that. You also have an option to create a new database on SQL Server or to uh, work with an existing database. In my experience, uh, if you're starting from scratch, of course, you're gonna want a new one. If you're running this more than once, simply delete the database from SQL Server, select new and recreate it from scratch. The existing database choice uh, seems to be designed for when you're adding a table or a view that uh, to a database that was already upsized, but uh, perhaps that table or that view was not yet included, then now you want to add that. So that would be where you want to use existing. Steps three and four are where you're going to spend a lot of your time. So we'll walk through these in a little bit of depth here. First of all, there's uh, check boxes for tables and or views. In this case, we've chosen to select both of them. So what's listed below that in that left-hand grid are the seven tables and the one view that are in this database. There are uh, check boxes for timestamp columns and identity columns. Timestamp columns, we're not gonna talk about, I'm not using them. Uh, if you want the upsizing wizard to create identity columns, which we mentioned a little earlier, you can tell it to do so. If your database already has primary keys, uh, you don't need to do this. If you have auto ink keys, they will be converted to identity columns anyway. On the other hand, if you have tables that don't have primary keys or identity columns and you want them to be created, you can just mark that here and uh, keep in mind that the column will be named identity underscore column in the SQL Server database. Over on the right then, in the right-hand grid, is a list of the fields and information about them uh, for whatever table is selected on the left. So on this slide, the customer table is selected, and on the right, we have a list of all the fields, and that's a scrollable list. We're only seeing the first few of them here. But what's important about that is this is where you can interactively control the data mapping. So by default, out of the box, the upsizing wizard will default to text from MO fields. Text is being deprecated, and it may go away totally in future versions of SQL Server. So the preferred choice now uh, is to choose varchar max or nvarchar max. And the nice thing about this interface is you can click on the word text, which is the server type data type. And if you do that, you get a little drop-down list and you can select the one you prefer. In this case, we're going to select nvarchar max. Now, if you're doing it interactively, you're going to need to do this for every memo field in every table in the database. So it's a little tedious. Uh, there's actually a way to change the defaults, and I'll show you that in a minute or two. So that's step four. Once you have everything set up the way you want it, um, oh, I'm going to show you how to modify the defaults uh, quickly here. They're in a table called underscore type map, which lives in the data subfolder of the upsizing wizard. So you can use that table and browse for server type SQL Server and local type M, which means memo. Uh, you'll get something like this. What you want to do to change the default for memo fields is to locate the row for text. That's the top row in this picture. And change the value of the default column from true to false then locate the row for nvarchar max and change the value of the default from false to true. So from then on, it will be the default and you won't have to do that interactively. The 
type map table is embedded in the app, so you're going to need to recompile the app or the change you made will not take effect. In the session downloads, uh, which by the way have been updated uh, probably yesterday, if not this morning, there is a file called updatetypemap.prg, which takes care of modifying the faults for memos and also for dates, which we'll see uh, as we go forward. But again, this is for the date and date time too that we talked about back in the data mapping section. So you can use that, or at least you can look at it and adapt it for your own purposes if you want to. So here's step five, uh, set upsizing options. This has several sections and each one is worth talking about separately. So what I'm gonna do is to kind of magnify each section starting with the upper left, the table attributes to upsize, and we'll talk about what's in there. So here's that first one. It's pretty clear, indexes, defaults, relationships, validation rules, if you want those to be upsized, mark the checkbox. Uh, I've never used structure only no data. Uh, typically when I'm running this, I wanna convert the data, so I leave that unmarked. I believe it's unmarked by default. But the bottom right one, use declarative RI, I believe is unmarked by default. And if you wanna carry over the relational integrity constraints from the visual FoxPro database to the SQL Server database, mark that checkbox. And later on, when I show you the generated SQL, you'll see what that does. Finally, at the bottom is where we can control dull mapping to some extent. The default is general fields override, but the choices are general and memo fields override, meaning both of those can be made null. All fields override means make everything nullable. And default setting means use however they're defined in the visual FoxPro database. So you do have some choices there. I didn't uh, make a point of showing it to you in the previous slide. Let me back up. But if you look on the right, there's a column for null on the far right where you can individually uh, make a choice, either nullable or not nullable uh, in that step before you get to step five. The next group of uh, changes, uh, the next group of options that you can uh, set relate to views under the heading changes to make locally. If you're upsizing local views, you can tell the upsizing wizard to redirect them to remote data. In other words, to modify them, make them into a remote view uh, by marking that checkbox. Create remote views on tables, the second line. Uh, the documentation actually says not to do this because the view that is created selects all the data from the entire table and that's not typically what you're going to want. You're probably going to want to set up parameterized views and just have them redirected. If there are passwords involved with the views, you can save them uh, in the generated uh, SQL Server database. Data uploads options. Here is where you can choose the bulk upload insert. It is significantly faster. I know Doug Henning wrote about this quite a while back. Uh, in my own use, uh, significantly faster. And if you're working with a large database, it's going to be even more important to do this. Again, you're going to need to install that uh, SQL XML uh, 4.0 SP1 component that we talked about earlier. Also in this blocks is where you can choose to upsize blank dates as null. It's an option, but if you don't do it, remember what blank dates default to, January 1st, 1900. Unless you want your application all of a sudden to start displaying the 0101 1900 where customers were used to seeing blanks, you probably want to upsize your blank dates to null. It's a choice, but in my experience, that's probably the better choice. Uh, the upsizing wizard creates a great amount of information about what it did. Uh, you can create a report. I would recommend leaving this checked. You can control where that goes. The default is a subfolder called upsize underneath whatever folder you're working in. The server temp folder at the very bottom, I don't know what that does. Uh, I've played with it, nothing seemed to change. I looked in the actual source code for the upsizing wizard. I saw it referenced a couple of times, but it didn't appear to anything was done with it. So I just suggest leaving it blank. If somebody listening knows more about that, they can pipe in perhaps in the question and answer section. But what's important here, the final thing on this step, is the advanced button in the upper right. If you click that, you get another dialog that enables you to turn primary keys into a clustered index. Um, this is not the 
session to talk about what a clustered index is other than to say that in a SQL Server database, all tables should have a clustered index. There can only be one. Usually, but not always, it's on the primary key. So if you want that to happen, you can check that option and the upsizing wizard will turn your primary key indexes into clustered indexes. Finally, when you're ready to finish up, you have three choices. You can upsize, and that's all. You can save the generated SQL without upsizing, or you can do both, which to me is the logical choice because I like to see what happened and actually do the upsizing process. As it runs, it'll display several progress bars. When it's done, it'll tell you it's complete. And you will have an equivalent database, assuming there were no significant errors, in your SQL Server. And so here's a comparison of the produce database as seen in Visual Fox Pro, the seven tables now exist in the SQL Server database. Notice that everything gets converted to the DBO schema. So there's all of our seven tables. But remember there was a view in our Visual Fox Pro database. And if we look at the views section in SQL Server, all we see is the system views. Well, what happened? Well, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect that since the tables were converted to tables in SQL Server, that the views would be converted to views in SQL Server. But that's not how it works. You remember the step where we said redirect local views to remote data? That's what it does. On the left in that red uh, highlighted area, the local view, which was called view invoice, has been renamed view invoice underscore local. A new remote view has been created with the same name as the original local view, which is great because then all of our references to that view in our source code continue to work as they did in the past. Also a connection was created and the connection was named upsize. So that's what it did. Now let's see if there were any problems and take a look at what happened. First thing you wanna do is there's a project called report or report one or report two, report three and so on if you run this multiple times without clearing out the old ones. If you look for a report called report errors, disregard the number, this one happens to be called number one. If that exists, there were some errors and you may wanna deal with them. So here's an example of what that report looks like. In this particular case, there were four errors. The bottom three, you can see on the left, uh, unable to create index. That's because I did not delete an index that was not convertible. So I'm gonna disregard those. I know about that and I'm just gonna get rid of that index. But the top one needed some inspection. 72 records not exported successfully for the table named vendor PO, that's the purchase order table. So I'd like some more information. Why were they not exported successfully? In the project manager for the uh, report project, flip over to the database, you'll find a database called upsize, one, two, or three, and so on. In the tables for that database, you'll see a table named export errors underscore, and then the table name, in this case, vendor PO, purchase orders. So in order to inspect what really happened on a column by, or row by row basis, we'll browse that table, which has the same structure as the underlying table vendor PO, but it has two more columns off to the right, one for the error number and one for the error message. So let's take a look at the error message, which is in a memo column, and there it is. Cannot insert the value null into column archived. Table is produce.dbo.vendorPO. Why? Because the column does not allow nulls. So the insert statement failed. SQL Server rejected that insert statement. So the question I had on this one, and I'm gonna take a little side trip here, is why was it trying to insert a null? Look at the red box, the archive column. It's, it's a logical field in Visual Fox Pro. It became a bit in SQL Server uh, and it was converted as not null. So it should be one or zero, uh, true or false, came from Visual Fox Pro. What could have possibly caused it to try and insert a null? Well, looking at it, here's what happened. It turns out that in a Fox Pro database, logicals can have three values. So this little piece of code generates three columns with a character field, ABC, and a logical field called archived, and it initializes the first two rows, but not the third one. 
And what you get is in row A, you get a capital T, which means true. In row B, you get a capital F, which means false. In row C, you get a blank, a space, which is the uninitiated, uh, initialized value for a logical field. So my speculation is that the upsizing wizard didn't expect this. I didn't take it so far as to look in the code. Uh, I probably should do that. Uh, but in this case, the archive column was defined as not null. Uh, it tried to insert a null, therefore the insert failed. And the solution was simply to go back to the Visual Fox Pro database and set the that column archive to false where it's not true. So not true will compare equal to both false and space. So in Fox, you know, that space doesn't cause any problems because Fox Pro deals with it as false. But in this situation, it actually did cause an issue. If you want to see the actual SQL script that was generated, look at the SQL underscore UW table. And there's only one column, script SQL, which is a memo column. And if you look at it, this is a fragment of the code uh, for the invoices table. It's kind of instructive to see what it does. And in the case of referential integrity, uh, I, I mentioned that I would point out what happens if you mark that checkbox for declarative RI. This is what happens. You get a statement that uh, implements the constraint that there is a foreign key relationship between the invoice and the customer. So that was uh, kind of a long haul there, but that was uh, really all there is to it. Six steps, a few options and you're good to go. So I will stop here and uh, ask if we have any questions for a minute or so. Uh, nothing that hasn't been answered already. Okay, good. Thanks, Rick. In that case, we will go ahead and move on. Uh, if you'll give me just a quick second of silence, I need to get a drink of water. Thank you, actually, much better. Actually, while you took a drink, someone posted a question. Okay, go ahead. How can you use SQL exec and get back a, a varchar into a cursor as a memo without cast? Without, I didn't hear without, the last word. Without casting it, casting oh. it through a text. Uh, it comes back as a memo. I, I didn't explore that directly in the session here, but I know I've used memo fields both ways in applications and I've not had an issue uh, without casting it. Can I take that question in the Q&A after this session? Sure, of course. We might have a chance to, to talk about that more. So the point that we're at in the process here in our, in our hypothetical scenario is to review quickly. We've made all the preparations for the conversion. We've dealt with issues in the Visual Fox Pro database that uh, might have tripped us up or caused errors. We've run the visual, the upsizing wizard, the VFP upsizing wizard. Uh, everything has gone smoothly. The application uh, now needs some attention. So what we're gonna talk about here is ways to modify the SQL in our Visual Fox Pro app to work with Transact SQL. Whether or not this is relevant to your application depends mostly on how your app is designed in the first place. If you're using local or remote views or cursor adapters, you probably aren't gonna have a lot of work to do in this area because all of that code is embedded in the views or the cursor adapter. But the this section of the presentation is kind of predicated on an app that is designed to work interactively with the Visual Fox Pro local tables using SQL select, insert, and so forth along with the uh, XBase commands. And so the requirement here is how to convert the visual Fox Pro SQL to transact SQL for use with SQL pass-through with SQL exec and so forth. So that's the, uh, that's the basis for this section of the uh, discussion here. So in order to take a look at the comparison between the two, here's a sample uh, insert statement in Visual Fox Pro SQL. Uh, and here's the equivalent statement in T-SQL. So the difference is, first of all, like anything else, no semicolons at the end of the statement of each line, except for the end. In T-SQL, it's 
not required, but it may at some point become required. So it's now customary to put a semicolon at the end of the entire statement. So basically, wherever there's a semicolon in VFP, take it out. Wherever there wasn't one in T-SQL, specifically at the end, put one in. Also notice that the uh, Visual Fox Pro, which lets us work with literals, either with double quotes, single quotes, or square brackets. In T-SQL, we have to use single quotes. And finally, on that bottom line, the strict date format uh, in Visual Fox Pro SQL, or Visual Fox Pro, it's not really SQL specific, uh, needs to be transformed into a simple year, month, day, eight character string, which is what we use for SQL Server. And date to string is a convenient way to do that. You can also use dashes in there, 1961-06-23, uh, but that turns out not to be necessary. So to me, date to string is the simplest way to get what you need. So let's take that example just a little bit further. Uh, we'll create the some variables so we can work with them instead of literals in the statement. Uh, these are kind of a proxy for what might be fields off a form or something, but right now we're just using local variables for the sake of illustration. So below on the left is the insert statement the way it would appear in Visual Fox Pro. In the upper right is the way that statement needs to appear in uh, T-SQL. And of course, the approach uh, is to wrap that in a text and text block and make the appropriate changes. Notice uh, we're using the uh, standard text merge delimiters, the left and right angle brackets. Notice also that the single quote marks have to go outside of the delimiters. And finally, the last or next to last line on the right before the end text is where we convert the birth date using date to string. So the statement that is generated and that gets passed by SQL exec to SQL server is what's shown at the very bottom. And that's the same as what we saw on the previous slide. So that's a very simple process, but if your app makes extensive use of uh, inline VFP SQL, you'll need to modify all of it uh, and typically doing what we've done here, wrapping it in text and text and then generating the appropriate statement. There are some cool things about uh, Transact SQL. One of them is it can have embedded comments. This is really a great feature for a lot of reasons. For one thing, you can write comments to yourself or to others reading your code. Uh, select star, well, it's well known that you shouldn't do that because DBAs will hate you. I think that's a true statement universally. Another use for this is uh, kind of experimenting. Look at the lines here, lines three and four. There are two where statements. One of them's commented out in line. Well, you couldn't do that in Fox, but in in T-SQL, in SQL Server, you can do that. So perhaps you want to experiment and see which of those two results uh, in a more efficient query, if one of them turns out to be more efficient. So what you could do, uh, either in your VFP app, or maybe you're working in SQL Server Management Studio, is to execute the same block of code and just alternate which one of those is commented out, and then look at the execution plan and see if you got a better result with one than from the other. I wanted to take a few minutes to compare functions in Visual Fox Pro and their equivalents in T-SQL, because some of them are almost the same, some of them are dissimilar, some of them are similar enough that they can be confusing. Uh, immediate if statements are identical, assuming you're using single quotes in Visual Fox Pro, it's exactly the same. If you want to check if a value is between two other values, the between statement or function exists in both Fox and T-SQL, but the syntax is different. So in all of these examples, I'm going to show Visual Fox Pro on the first line and T-SQL on the bottom line. Uh, so birth date between uh, January 1st of 61 and December 31st of 61. Uh, similarly, if you want to check if a value occurs in a list, it's the in list function in Visual Fox Pro, of course. The, the similar syntax in T-SQL is simply in and then the list in parentheses. So very much the same thing. Nulls, it's a little tricky because there's some, uh, the is null function has a different meaning in T-SQL than in Visual Fox Pro. If you want to check if a value is null in Fox, you say is null parentheses my variable. In T-SQL, you say, if my var is null, two words separated with a space. T-SQL has an is null, but it has a different meaning. It substitutes null. Uh, 
So in Fox, if we want to substitute a value for null, we use the null value NVL function. In T-SQL, we use is null. So there's another place where you need to scan your code and see if you're using is null in an embedded T-SQL statement, it's going to have a different meaning. Empty doesn't exist in T-SQL. You have to actually compare to a specific value, a space or a zero or a, a whatever data type it is that you're working with. True, false, again, we mentioned that those get converted to bit values. So true is one, zero is false. A couple of other differences in the way you might have structured your queries. In Visual Fox Pro, uh, this query runs just fine. This says, how many invoices are there in, that have more than 20 items? Uh, just to, for, as an example. So that statement as written works fine in Visual Fox Pro. It does not work fine in T-SQL. The reason is that you can't use the column alias in the having clause the way we can use it in Visual Fox Pro. In T-SQL, which is a little more strict about things, you have to use the predicate, which is count star. Again, you have to restate that in the having clause. Uh, you can't say how many. Similarly, the order of the statements makes a difference. Uh, in the previous slide, we had the order by as the last line. If we are working in Fox and we flip that and we make order by the next to last and having as the last, it works just fine. In T-SQL, it does not work. You have to have the uh, order by as the last line. So there, this is only a couple of examples of the type of thing you might expect to run into. When working with indexes, and we talked about this when we were introducing the uh, getting ready for upsizing section, uh, this index is actually from a real app. It looks pretty bizarre, uh, but what it does is to order the items for printing on an invoice in groups in the way that the customer wanted them sequenced. So it was an important part of that application. Uh, there's no way that index is going to work in SQL Server, but all is not lost. There's always more than one way to do things. And in T-SQL, we can simply create uh, a column using cast and then a series of uh, immediate if statements to create the same thing, one way to approach it. So again, if you have indexes that you carefully constructed and feel like your app depends on them and you realize you can't convert them to SQL Server, don't be overly concerned. There's always another way to go about it. Insert statements in your code can be a source of problems. In Visual Fox Pro, if you don't list all the columns in an insert statement, Fox Pro inserts the default value for its data type. So it could be a space or a false or an empty date or whatever it is. In SQL Server, it's different. In SQL Server, if you don't list all the columns, the ones that you don't list are set to null. The problem exists, as you can well anticipate, if a column is defined as not null. So let's look at an example. Uh, here's a Visual Fox Pro insert statement with seven fields. There's actually 16 fields in that vendors table, uh, the ones that are not listed simply get set to their default values for their data type. So no problem in Visual Fox Pro. However, in SQL Server, if we list only those seven columns, the ones that are not listed are defined in this example as not null. What happens when SQL Server runs that statement? it tries to insert null into the ones that are not listed and the statement fails because they will not accept a null. So a couple of three things you can do about that. You could modify the database to allow nulls, but to me that means dealing with the consequence of nulls in comparisons and in visual presentation and forms and reports all throughout the app. Uh, personally, I, I like to avoid nulls whenever possible, so I don't adopt this as a as the solution to this. Another solution is to add a default value constraint for all the columns. That way, when you don't list a column, SQL Server inserts its default value rather than its uh, rather than a null, but that has to be an explicit default value. So that's something you could take care of at conversion time or in preparation for uh, upsizing. Or finally, you could modify the insert statement to list all the columns and provide an appropriate value for them. 
Similarly, when working with insert statements that involve date columns, there's a couple of things to be alert for. Uh, if a date time column is omitted from an insert statement, that's okay. Assuming that we allowed them to be upsized to null, which we did by default. You remember that choice we had on the uh, the uh, in the upsizing wizard? We we said we wanted dates to, empty dates to be null, so that implies that the column is nullable in SQL Server. So really, no problem there if you allow them to be null. But if we include the date time column, then you've got a couple of things to think about. If you specify a value, a valid value, this was August 19th of this year, you get a valid date, so no problem. If you specify a null, also no problem because the column is nullable. What happens if you specify an empty string? Why would you specify an empty string? Where would that come from? Well, remember we're using date to string. And what happens if you date to string an empty date? You get eight spaces. So what happens in that case? Do you get a null? You might think so because it means you know value is not known, but that's not what happens. You get 1900.0101, which is the SQL Server default for an empty date. So that can be an issue, as we'll see in a couple of slides. Now, briefly, uh, other things that you might need to change in your application is data binding on forms. So here's a sample purchase order form with several fields on it. Whether or not this is something you're going to need to change a lot depends, again, on how your app is structured. If the app is using local views, remote views, or cursor adapters, or even if it's using a cursor who's same with the same name as the table, then the reference in the control source property of that field on the form is going to be OK, because that will continue to exist. Where it's not going to be OK is what happens in many particularly older VFP apps that work directly with the local tables where you reference the table name directly uh, because that's no longer going to be able to be done when you're interacting with remote data on SQL Server. Uh, so what are your choices? Well, you can convert the app to use cursor adapters, remote views, uh, which is a lot of work. Personally, I like business objects. Let me back up a minute. It's a lot of work if the app wasn't designed that way initially. So we're we're coming from an app that did not was not designed that way. Uh, I think business objects are a good choice in that situation. Typically, a good business object would have load, save, new methods, which makes life pretty easy for you. So if you're uh, in in the form we saw a minute ago, if our purchase order number field was originally looking directly at the vendor PO table in the Visual Fox Pro database, that no longer works when we're working with SQL Server, and we have to change that. So in this example, uh, I'm creating a hypothetical business object called O Vendor PO, and referencing that in the data uh, in the control source for that particular field. Uh, it's a lot of work. You got a lot of forms in your app. You got a lot of fields on each form. Every one of them needs to be changed, but it's a one-time change. Once it's done, it's done. So that's one way to approach that kind of a thing. Navigation requires a little bit of work as well. Um, in in my apps, my customers are accustomed to and actually like very much like seeing that first, last, next, previous type of navigation with the VCR controls. Uh, in SQL Server, there is no concept of first and last and next and previous. There, there's no sequence. Well, there is with the clustered index, but that's really kind of a different discussion. So in order to implement that sort of thing in uh, when working with SQL Server from the Fox app, you need a cursor of some kind, but you don't want to create a cursor of the entire table just to be able to get to the thing you need to navigate. All you need is the primary key, which might be actually the same as the value in this case of the purchase order number, which is the sequence that you want to present the navigation in. So one way to approach this is to create a cursor with only enough information to support navigation, then to modify the code in the first, last, next, previous buttons to move in the cursor, and once you have the appropriate primary key value, simply call load if you're using a business object, and then refresh the screen and you've got what you need. So that was a quick tour through what might have to happen in your application to uh, modify it to work with your new SQL Server app. So let's talk now about what can go wrong 
and what you can do about it. So you've, you've done everything right as far as you know, and you deploy the app and on day one, this is kind of story time here, day one, your customer calls and says, hey, I'm seeing the word dot null dot in date fields. I don't like that. I want you to change that. Well, why is that happening? Well, that one's obvious. It's because we set dates, empty dates to null. The date closed in this particular purchase order was empty, so it showed up as a null. The quick solution is simply to set null display to the empty string, keeping in mind that this is global. Uh, it's not just date fields. It's not scoped to the data session. And by the way, it affects the debugger too. So if you're debugging a value and you have set null display to empty string, you're not gonna see the word null in the debugger. You're gonna see an empty string, which might cause confusion at first. So you fix that. You redeploy the app and update. Now the customer goes along for a couple of days and then they call you and say, hey, I'm seeing January 1st, 1900 in a date field. Why am I seeing this? I don't like that. I want you to fix it. And so you scratch your head a little bit and you say, well, why is that there? I thought we took care of that. We converted all empty dates to nulls in the upsizing wizard. What's going on? Let's look at the code a little bit. Well, here we have some code and this is a fragment of an insert statement and the delivery date is being uh, passed as a date to string. Well, as it happens in this particular purchase order, the delivery date was not known at the time it was entered. Therefore, it was left blank. Therefore, it did a DTOS on a blank date, which generated eight spaces. And we know what happens with that. We get 1900.0101. And so what we have to do to deal with that is to check to see if it's empty and substitute a null if it is. Otherwise, go ahead and pass date to string uh, surrounding it in single quotes. So that's one thing that can happen. And that results in passing a null, which works just fine because that's going to show up as blank. Character strings can also be problematic. Uh, in this example, look at the notes slash special instructions down toward the bottom right. I'll make that a little bigger. Uh, what happened here was the customers had, or the company has had trouble with this vendor and they've gotten some bad looking lettuce in the past. So they've made a note on the purchase order, don't ship brown or wilted lettuce. They try and save this record. They get an error message, incorrect syntax near T. Well, these messages are more for us as developers. At least it tells the customer what happened, but uh, it's not too difficult for us as the developer to see why. We look at the word don't, there's an embedded single quote that terminates the literal, that makes the rest of it uh, invalid syntax. So SQL Server uh, rejects that statement. So that is easy enough to take care of. We simply string trim that. Uh, you'd probably have this as a method somewhere in a general utility where you just call it rather than doing it inline. But for illustration, it's doing it inline here. Replace it with double quotes and that's fine. So you make that change. You recompile the app, you deploy it. The customer uh, actually, hopefully you test before you deploy it again, because what's gonna happen is with the same code, you're gonna get a different error this time. String or binary data would be truncated and then it goes on with some indication of what would be truncated. So here's where you're gonna to have to look kind of close in this example. Look at the bottom line in the error message. Don't, and notice the two quotes in don't, so that's okay now. Don't ship brown or wilted lettuce exclamation point. Well, there's only one exclamation point in that truncated value. There's two in what got passed. What's the issue here? The issue is the string is too long. The notes column is char 35. What they entered was 36 characters long. The reason this can bite you is that FoxPro doesn't care. FoxPro truncates that for us and lets us be lazy. We like being lazy. We like to have things handled for us, but SQL Server is a little more strict on that. SQL Server says, hey, you gotta pay attention to this kind of thing. SQL Server does care about that and it will raise an error, which is exactly what happened in this case. So what you do about it is quick and dirty, you simply string, uh, you trim the notes field, which you've already uh, taken care of the single quote issue and make it 35 characters long. That's really not a good solution. The better solution obviously is to enforce that limit in the form so that uh, they can't enter more than the maximum value. But because Fox let us be a little lazy, maybe the form didn't do that and it never was an issue until now. So how about trapping errors and, and uh, 
showing an error message to the user. How do we do that? Well, the easy way uh, is simply to look for a return value of minus one on SQL exec. Again, this is all predicated on using SQL pass through. So how do we then debug from there, assuming that's what got returned? Well, we set a breakpoint on the SQL exec statement. We then copy that to the clipboard. We copy it over into SQL Server Management Studio and execute it. And we can check uh, for the details of the error message there if we're not already returning it in our Fox Pro app. By the way, I run into this, I use this debug method a lot. Uh, I really found it awkward to type underscore clip text equals a lot of times in the command window. So I created the little IntelliSense add-on for that, that simply I can type the word clip. So clip, I type clip and then it replaces it with underscore clip text equals. So clip LC SQL takes the place of running or typing the longer string. So now that we know how to trap the error, we can display an error message. Well, so far we don't have any error information. All we have is the error message. Or we, we know that an error occurred so we can create a message, but not without much information. So a SQL Server error occurred, whatever you were doing didn't work. That's not really very helpful to either you or to the customer. Let's see if we can make that better. And the way we make that better is by looking at the error array so we simply reference or call a error into an a array i'm calling it la error here and then the information that you want is typically going to be in the third element and if we construct an error message using that information it's going to look like this at least we get the full information about what happened and it tells us what went wrong on what table and what column and what the value the truncated value in this case was now there's a side note here. The highlighted information on this uh, slide is what's called the extended information. It was introduced in SQL Server 2019. It was available in 17 and 16 with certain updates which are listed here. But if you don't have SQL Server 2019 and you were using an earlier one without those updates, all you're gonna get is string or binary data would be truncated. You're not gonna get the extended information. So just a heads up on that. But with the extended information, uh, you can create a much better error message. We can strip out this part, which is really not of any value to the uh, end user, and we can now create a much better error message uh, showing what happened, and everybody's a little happier. So I'll pause here again for questions. Uh, we're right on time, but we do have a minute or so to take questions. Rick, uh, is there anything on the board? Telling you, Rick, we got a couple of SQL Server Jedi's just whacking and stacking your questions for you already. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I look forward. I hope there's a transcript of the chat that I can look at after the session here. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm sure I will learn some things. So we're good to go then? Yep. Thank you. Well, we'll wrap up with the last uh, segment here. Um, I want to introduce you to a tool uh, for documenting SQL Server databases. And here, here's the background for this. Uh, like most of you, I've been working with FoxPro for a long time. And way back when I discovered a tool called Print Structures, I wish I could credit the author. I don't know who wrote it. I've lost track of where I downloaded it. I couldn't find it on the search anymore. But it was a really nice tool for creating printable documentation of the columns and their attributes and the indexes and their expressions uh, in a visual FoxPro database. And I use that all the time. Uh, even if you don't actually visit, print it on paper, uh, you might create it in a file and reference it. So I, I use that documentation frequently, particularly useful in uh, code columns where, you know, one means something and two means something else. And if you haven't worked with it for a long time, you may not remember what those values are. And of course, in a FoxPro database uh, container, you can store comments or descriptions and you can document that stuff. And then if you print the documentation or write it to a file, you can go back and look and not have to rely on memory. What does one mean? What does two mean? What is this field all about? What's this table for? All of that kind of stuff, both table comments and uh, column comments. When I started working with SQL Server, I kind of missed that. There are tools that let you do that in SQL Server. Uh, I haven't found any free ones. You can actually do it through SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, 
uh, it's kind of tedious. And if you already have all of that documentation in your Visual Fox Pro database, wouldn't it be nice if you could transfer that directly to the new SQL Server database and not have to type it all in again? So that's what this tool is all about. So I want to introduce what I'm calling VFP SQL Doc. And I'll explain what that's all about. And by the way, this is available to you uh, being released here in, at this conference for the first time uh, in the session downloads to you who are attending today. Uh, so this, again, had two objectives. I wanted to be able to generate printable documentation, table and column descriptions, index information, and so forth. And the second objective was to copy table and column descriptions from a Visual Fox Pro database container to SQL Server. So those were the two goals. The print structures feature is exactly that. It lists the columns and indexes and their attributes, and it works with any SQL Server database. I will show you an example with AdventureWorks 2019 here in a minute. It will generate either a Visual Fox Pro report or a markdown file. It just happen to be the two choices that I implemented at this point. The second feature is the update SQL Server feature. That reads comments from a database container, copies them into the uh, appropriate field in the SQL Server database for those tables. Uh, it does require a database with the same structure as the Visual Fox Pro DBC that you're coming from. So the intent here is to use this immediately after upsizing when those two things are directly in sync with one another. How you use it is very straightforward. Uh, I didn't create any kind of a user interface for it. It's simply a single PRG file. It's a Visual Fox Pro class. You run it from the command window, instantiate the object, and call whatever methods are necessary. So let me show you the code for the print structures. Uh, if we instantiate the object, it's called class or CLS VFP SQL doc. You have to set a connection string. That's really one line, but it's two on the slide because of the width limitation. So in this case, I'm accessing the AdventureWorks 2019 database with a trusted connection. The next two lines are optional. If you don't specify a schema, it'll be defaulting to DBO. And if you don't set a table name, it'll default to all tables within the schema. In this case, just for illustration, I wanted to pull out a single table from the sales schema. So I will specify the customer table. And then we simply call print structures. The default is a Visual Fox Pro report. If you want a markdown report, you simply set report type to two, call print structures again. And then that little beep, if you heard it, was my two minute warning. Uh, we call print structures again, and the file is named after the database the schema and the table, if the schema and table were uh, involved, it'll be DBO if you didn't specify anything else. And then we can modify the table or the file, excuse me, and then see what it looks like. And we release the instance. So here's what it looks like. Oh, by the way, you can download this. This is in the session downloads. Uh, it's called test underscore VFP SQL doc dot PRG. So you have this code. And if you have AdventureWorks 2019, you can run it. Otherwise, just put in your own connection string for whatever database you want to try it on. It's non-destructive, doesn't do anything except read. So this, this is the print structures feature. And here's what it looks like. This is, I know that's hard to read, but uh, you don't need to try and read it here. It's actually also in the appendix to the white paper. Uh, it lists the table, what schema it's in, the table comments, and then all of the columns, along with their data type and other attributes, whether or not they're nullable. And at the bottom, uh, index information including the name and what type of index that it is. Similar report uh, in markdown file format as viewed in one particular editor that I happen to use uh, gives you exactly the same information. Each report has a date and timestamp on it. So you know when it was documented and if you have updated, you can make sure your documentation that you're referring to is not an old one. Uh, to run the update SQL Server, it's very much the same thing. You have to tell it uh, the database you want to come from, that's the set VFP database line in the middle there. Um, I'm using the produce database. I did not give you this code. Uh, again, my suggestion is going to be, if you want to work with the upsizing wizard, uh, use a database that you're familiar with. I didn't want to give you the produce sample database because it's not one that's familiar to anybody else except me. So try it with your own stuff. Uh, this is 
I don't want to say destructive, but it does update SQL Server. So be sure you have a backup. And I think I built in a couple of warnings in the code, but you get the source code for this. So you can look at it and see what it does. Uh, this is what's in the download. There's a zip file that contains everything that's listed below, except for the VFP SQL doc test, which is a separate PRG. And again, the uh, materials, including the white paper and the down, and the examples were updated, I think yesterday or, or perhaps even today. Uh, and thank you tomorrow for doing that. Please give me some feedback on this. It's a brand new tool. I don't know if anybody else is gonna find it useful or not, but I would like to know uh, if you do find it useful, you know, shoot me a line, let me know about that. If there's enough interest, I would consider putting this up on GitHub, uh, possibly even a VFPX project. Um, so, you know, just let me know what you think about it. So we're done. Uh, to summarize, this is where we've been today. Hopefully you learned a few things about preparing, mapping data types and using the wizard. Uh, we saw a little bit about what might need to be done in your code to adapt to using T-SQL. I showed you how to uh, trap errors, and, and I, we talked about a few things that can go wrong and what you can do about them. And then finally, I showed you this uh, VFP SQL doc tool, which I hope you find useful. Uh, again, the session white papers and examples have been updated. Please do fill out your evals. They are extremely important to us. We do read them. We do use them and improve future sessions based on your comments. Uh, this is my contact information, also in the white paper. And I know we're out of time. Thank you for your attention today. I hope you've had a great conference and I will see you in the Q&A session in just a few minutes.